Welcome to the Start for Water vlog. My name is Anne Nichten. I'm your anchor woman. In this series, we'll have conversations with artists who are currently working as artists in residence at the Start Partner Institutes. I would like to welcome our guest today, Mark Eisenman from the Netherlands, who is doing his residency at V2 in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and Klaas Kuitenbrouwer, researcher at Het Nieuwe Instituut and initiator of Zoo Operations in the Netherlands. Welcome to both of you. And Mark, um, I would like to invite you. Can you introduce yourself and tell us in short something about the project you are currently developing in your residency at V2? Yeah, sure. So my name is Mark Eisenman and I'm an interdisciplinary artist and I work on the intersection of media art and ecology. Um, I will share my screen to give you a bit of an insight into my work. Um, so my recent work, uh, in my recent work, I often use technological processes that have their own agency to create an intimacy of some sort between other than humans and humans. So an example of this is, for example, the installation on the top right you see here, which is an installation created with Axel Koemans and Arita Bayens, in which we train an AI on poetic texts about the North Sea. So visitors get to lay down on uh, fishing nets. I think I have another image here on these fishing nets and then um, trust or ask something to the North Sea. And this will be answered from the AI corpus, which is trained on uh, these uh, poetic texts about the North Sea to kind of get close to a uh, voice of the North Sea. So this is um, a recent project. And um, I really like positioning myself in this friction between technological means to talk about uh, uh, other than human. Um, and it started after a residency I did in Chile at Valley of the Possible in 2019. Um, and when I still came back, I started exploring the, this, this tension. Um, one of my first experiments that I did back then was actually this uh, barnacle uh, where I trained um, uh, artificial intelligence on articles about barnacles and in the AI process I kind of flipped it around so it starts talking from the perspective of the barnacle about humans or at least it seems so and in this case we kind of get to feel uh, the textual difference with which, with, with which we talk about the non-human. Um, and this is an experiment I did back then, but it still informs my recent practice. Um, and uh, the, the project for Starts actually started over a year ago or so when I uh, was doing, or actually during COVID, when I was doing walks with city ecologists um, in my hometown of Amsterdam and asked them, like, what are kind of new species um, that uh, uh, came here that are non-native? Uh, that are relating also to climate change. And they pointed me towards this, um, uh, this Cecil creature, this uh, uh, Australian tube worm or trompet calc coco worm in Dutch, um, which can build reefs up to like two by four meters. And um, uh, when I saw the call for the starts uh, biodiversity in the port of Rotterdam, uh, I kind of had to think of this because there is kind of a, a uh, nice contrast between these, or also similarity between this uh, ecosystem builder, this tube worm, which builds all these ecosystems, as well as uh, the um, uh, the infrastructures that we build in the port. And these creatures are actually also clogging up infrastructures in the port. So I thought this was a nice kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, contrast to explore. Um, so during my process, I talked to a lot of different people, um, ecologists and biologists and scientists, uh, but I started um, working a lot and visiting the port with Peter Paalvast, who's also a biologist and ecologist who researches biodiversity in the Rotterdam port for the port company and is also working on um, biodiversity regeneration and also species monitoring. And so here you see some of his kind of things that he works with. So these planks to kind of monitor species as well as uh, different things for regeneration of, uh, of uh, biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, 
And during our trip, we also found these uh, the tube worm that I was interested in in the in the port actually. So these are some pictures from that with really overgrown, um, yeah, overgrown uh, uh, sculptures in the port. Um, and I was also happy to find a species in the port because I didn't know if it was going to be there. It lives in brackish waters, but you never know. Um, and I, at the same time, when I was visiting Porta, I also started doing a lot of desk research, not only into this tube worm, but also into the bigger picture of how the new mass, uh, the, the port area actually evolved over the last two centuries or so. So it used to be a more estuarian uh, area and it kind of got dammed in and uh, got um dredged to become deeper for ships to pass through, losing its estuarian character and also making it so that there's a, a lot more chance that it might flood, actually. Um, and then I also started talking to people like Han Meyer, who wrote a lot on uh, uh, port cities, cities in uh, Delta areas, uh, how if we want to, we, that we kind of keep this up and his research is also about what this will look like if we allow this water more space in our lives, basically. So he wrote this uh, mouth of the Rhine as an estuary. Um, and uh, this was also inter interesting to my research to kind of, um, yeah, shape the, the bigger picture. Uh, I started doing different kind of um, tests with different elements in my work. Um, uh, involving the, the, the hyperlocal, the, the species, uh, as well as the history and futures of human interventions in, in the sport area. Um, and yeah, I started looking at how these elements kind of work together. Uh, so from using uh, data, live data of uh, ships in the port to uh, using 3D renders of uh, growth prediction of uh, these species on different models, as well as uh, letting different elements clash. So uh, lyrics from shanty songs uh, on, uh, on uh, objects of economic, of endless economic growth um, to see how, uh, how I could use these in my, uh, in my sculpture. Um, and this way I kind of started getting a feel for what did and didn't work. Uh, so what kind of di didn't work eventually was, uh, using this, uh, this data, for example, this is something that is hard to kind of give an effect, um, while, uh, what kind of did work is bringing different elements together in the sense of having this species there, having, uh, an object which signifies economic growth and preparing it in the same way that the biologist would have to get species to kind of grow on it. Um, so I kind of drafted up what which elements did and did, didn't work. Um, so the growth worked and the data didn't. And from there on, I kept refining my ideas of my project. Uh, I started working more and more also with a shanty choir to kind of involve the human skill again, because the port is so big and these worms are so small that we're kind of missing a human skill in there. And also when you involve this human skill, you can kind of talk about the history and the future by using a song in a way. Uh, also shanty is of course immaterial heritage, which is also going to be lost. Uh, so there is a nice kind of uh, compliment, compliment there. And I was also, because these are people who worked in the port a lot, uh, able to talk to them about well, how do they feel that this area will be changing uh, uh, in the future. Um, at the moment, I have these sculptures hanging in the port area. So they're uh, hopefully being, hopefully the, the, the species that I work with uh, will want to kind of grow on the, uh, uh, the objects that I'm uh, hanging in the port uh, as to be part of the final work that we are presenting in September. Uh, this is a draft of what my idea for the installation is, but it will uh, possibly change. So I'll ha I will have the, uh, my research as well as the, uh, the, the shanty choir uh, singers in there singing a shanty about how the port was, is, and always will be the same. But I subverted this shanty and kind of edited it for it to be uh, leave some space and uh, for people to reflect on uh, how this will possibly change. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the, the, the current idea for the exhibit in September. Um, and that was kind of a short run through of, uh, uh, what I've been working on.
Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Mark. Um, one minor question before we move on. Can you inform our audience about the size of the tube worm? How, hmm. how big is this? The tube worms are, are quite tiny. Um, so they can make, I don't know what the maximum width or uh, diameter of the, of the tubes is, but <clears throat> half a centimeter or so uh, maximum. Uh, but they make reefs of up to two by four meters. So they can really kind of form big kind of sculptures. You also saw it in one of the pictures where you see my hand on this, uh, um, on, the, on the colony of tube worms. It kind of gives an idea. Wow, such a tiny worm in the immense port of Rotterdam. Yeah. That's a nice contrast. Thank you. Uh, we come back to your work throughout the whole conversation. But first, I would like to ask uh, Klaas to uh, introduce yourself. And maybe you can also explain us in brief what Zoe Operation is and how this connects to Mark's work. Yes, uh, I will. Uh, thank you, Mark. Fantastic presentation. Really interesting and beautiful work that touches on many uh, aspects with the stuff I'm working on. Um, I'm Klaas Kuitenbrouwer, researcher at the Nieuwe Instituut, where I initiated the ZOOP project. ZOOP is actually the word we use more often than ZOOP operation. ZOOP is short for ZOOP operation, obviously. Um, uh, uh, ZOOP operation is short for cooperation with ZOE. So, collaboration with life uh, in short it's um, uh, something i've been working on for the past three years with a large group of people ecologists farmers lawyers designers artists um, and more philosophers and uh, that has now since actually a month really come to fruition uh, because we've initiated the, the first actual zoop so what is a zoop it's um uh, okay one step back a zoo operation is an organization model that basically any organization can adopt. Uh, and by becoming a zoo, op, an organization adds the goal of ecological regeneration to its core practices. It's uh, the model consists of two parts. One part is a governance model uh, that is so it, it talks to the way uh, an organization is run. Um, and this comes down to adding a specific uh, a person in a certain capacity to your organization that has one task only, namely to represent the interests of other than human life within the operational sphere of the organization, of the ZOOP. So there's a technical bit to that, that person receives his or her assignment from our own legal innovation, uh, namely the Zoonomic Foundation. This is a foundation that has only one goal, and that is uh, this is laid down in the statutes, and this is to represent the interests of other than human life within ZOOP. So if you receive your assignment from this foundation, that means you're legally bound to these statutes. This is what you can do. So that doesn't talk about the practice of how to do this, but at least it cuts out, it uh, eliminates a certain risk of getting interfered in all kinds of uh, particular human agendas, budget questions and other things. This is not your job if you take on this role. Your job is to represent the interests of other than human life. Uh, this person has the role of advisor, teacher, but also has a specific mandate to give a binding advice on certain aspects uh, uh, or certain aspects of the operations of the of the ZOOP uh, to the board. Um, that is, and this is binding if the organization wants to be a ZOOP, because uh, they mean they can Technically, they can ignore the advice, but that also means at some point they're no longer a ZOOP. So if you want to be a ZOOP, um, you have to listen to this advice. Okay, that's the governance part. And then what you do together with the speaker for the living, as this person is called, is uh, you basically go through an annual learning process uh, that um, comes down to um, two things. Reading your own operation according to three in essence, simple questions, although they're, to answer them is, is, is um, to answer them in full is impossible. You, uh, the only thing you can do is learn every year more about how to answer these questions. And they uh, give you insight in the way your organization is an ecological actor, the way it is a body in 
the ecosystems it participates in. Um, uh, based on this reading, this uh, 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 we call this the first time you do this is the baseline assessment. Based on this reading, uh, you formulate as an organization your regenerative goals or your points of regenerative care, and you plan interventions to uh, meet these goals. And this you go through every year. And the speaker for the living helps the organization to go through this. So it's a learning process in essence, but with a specific added element of a governance model. That means that what you learn uh, is kind of guaranteed to be implemented to the extent that this is possible within the organization. Um, so uh, we invented this obviously to, and I guess this is clear, uh, to, 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 to offer a kind of uh, perspective for action for many organizations that I mean everybody that well reads at least uh, yeah half one newspaper page a week uh, is deeply worried about the uh, uh, climate crisis and it's really going out of hand in an extremely rapid way um, and policy bodies uh, laws infrastructures are way too slow to respond to this and this is not only um, lack of political will this is also because these these processes are extremely complex involve a lot of different parties and a lot of stuff that has has to happen in the right order before things begin to move right? the uh, the ecological crisis is built into our infrastructure into our law system into our financial system and it's not easy to just get rid of this so how to act within such a sphere we think the only possibility is to organize this as a learning process to give sufficient agency to organizations to enter this learning process and then the last bit is that zoops collaborate so we have to learn from each other also so i'm very happy to be able to say that uh, the model is gaining a lot of um, is getting a lot of attention is getting a lot of um, very interested response so uh, yeah we think for the uh, near future, there will be quite a lot of zoops. Um, uh, also, uh, on different scales, not only let's say the cultural institutions and the advanced thinkers, but really also, yeah, parties involved in infrastructure, commercial enterprises, etc. Um, the Rotterdam Harbor to cut to mark uh, is not yet uh, in the picture, but is of course extremely interesting and has its own extremely kind of. Um, it is quite ambitious on this field, but it's also, of course, yeah, it's extremely tied up with the whole global extractivist economy in yeah more than almost any other body in the Netherlands. So it's not an easy, let's say, uh, body to work with. Uh, but your particular work, Marx, yeah, touches on Zoop on many different aspects. First, it's general aspiration. It's the way it tries to organize encounters between humans and other than humans. This is at the heart of Zoop also, that um, and the, the basic, uh, one of the basic impulses was that we really have to get rid of this uh, fatal historical mistake of uh, uh, believing that nature is somewhere else than where humans live, uh, that it starts behind the fence. And this is, yeah, this, so much, this was extremely, let's say, interesting idea because it led to the control that led the European economy to become the standard for the global uh, for the global um, economy but it's also the idea that uh, well got us into the problems uh, we're in and yeah we need to and yeah as you yeah you 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 mentioned already the valley of the possible uh, where uh, also yeah um, yeah several indigenous worldviews uh, let's say are are have brought to the fore and are, are kind of put in the center of attention and yeah I only want to say that it's not such, um, uh, let's say, only Europe has invented this rather weird separation between uh, uh, nature and culture. Any other cosmology in the world has kind of uh, stayed away from it with a good reason, but somehow it became, because it led to so much control, yeah, it led to the it becoming the standard of the, the, the world we're in. But all these other cultures, let's say, still have access to this worldview. And within Europe, this is a bit harder to organize because we really kind of, as I said, we built this in everything that we work with. So that's why Zoop does not first build on this cultural assumption or this other cultural concepts, but actually it, it works with um, yeah, an organization model, which is the language that is very much, let's say, something we're familiar with. So. And then in its wake, by following such an organization model in the space that opens up like that, uh, the, let's say touching these other cultural concepts becomes, um, uh, uh, let's say, accessible and becomes, becomes actually something that you cannot avoid anymore. 
yeah, and this this re really rearranges this whole sphere of relations between humans and other than humans. So that's one aspect it touches on your work. And the second one is also that you're very much interested in figuring out, um, let's say, processes of regeneration. And this is, of course, the yeah the the, the key work of Zoop. So I'm also very interested in the tube, the Australian tube worm, and its uh, yeah, and how it uh, reorganizes its surroundings. Um, I also find it interesting that it's an, not originally a European species. This is um, sometimes this is hard for conservationists, people that have protect nature. The idea that species travel from ecosystem to ecosystem and then yeah, are treated with a little bit of skepsis, skepticism. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, mm, mm, that's a bit too long to go into, but I no, think no, it's no, no, interesting. But... Yeah. Uh, I think this is an interesting point. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, ask Mark to react on that. So, Mark, why does this uh, tube worm, in your view, represent the sustainable challenge of the biodiversity in the port of Rotterdam? Well, it's a, it's a, like Klaas said, it's a non-native species. That's what the, the, the biologists and ecologists call it. Um, and the question is, for whom? Uh, I mean, it's a species that came here through the, the fact that the waters became more salt, so salinity went up. Uh, so now it's uh, moving closer to cities, it's close to Amsterdam, it's close to uh, the center of Rotterdam. Um, and But for whom is it um, bad or har harmful? It's creating, it's, it's an ecosystem builder, so it creates these structures which are actually, uh, which other species thrive on. So species can kind of go into it, find uh, shelter, uh, find food, etc. Uh, so it's basically only uh, harmful for humans who want to build really nice ship hulls or uh, um, uh, hard substrate uh, walls on the, on the side of rivers, for example. So in that in that sense, it's uh, it's an invasive species, uh, but for all the other species, it's not actually. So does that mean that this uh, invasive tube worm actually is already claiming a seat in the board of uh, the Rotterdam port? Yeah, you could see it like that. That would be great, actually. Yeah, I thought about that of having it as a as a mascot of some sense, mm -hmm. um, as a spokesperson for the other kind of species which thrive on its existence in the, in the port. Klaas, um, if uh, one would uh, continue uh, with your uh, concept of the ZOAPs, would you then invite Mark, for example, to be the speaker for the living uh, when it comes to the tube worm in the port? Uh, that's actually a very good idea. Uh, there's one, one uh, remark though, um, the speaker for the living does not speak on behalf of a single species. Uh, but Ooh. I think it, it's always a larger whole. It's always a collective okay. body of many uh, mutually supportive uh, bodies. Uh, but, uh, in a way, the tube worm does exactly this. I mean, I think this is a f fantastic example of this, had this kind of keystone species that allow, uh, but it's next, I'm using the term now in a not correct way, ecologically, but um, uh, um, that is an ecosystems builder, like humans are in a way, like uh, beavers are, certain ants are, termites, and a couple of species that have this capacity and they really organize life carrying capacity of, of larger holes. So it's, I think it's a fantastic uh, protagonist uh, for the harbor. Yeah. And indeed, if it's, yeah, if it helps um, creating living environments for other than humans in the harbor, and uh, I don't see why this, I mean, it, it could very well be the main, let's say, protagonist of the efforts of the speaker for the living. But yeah. it's not only the tube worms interest that are represented, it's then also the algae and the lichens and the fish and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Yeah, the thing is that when when you work on a project like this, I don't know if it's going to grow on my sculpture, sculptures, for example. So you will you will always have this, but a lot is is growing on it for sure, uh, definitely. So we will see in September, 
uh, when I take it out. What is grown on it? There is a lot of uh, already seaweed and all sorts of uh, species growing on it. But I think this uh, kind of um, a purity or what do you call it doesn't make sense in ecological terms, of course. So even with a project like this, I started with the tube worm. We might end up somewhere else, uh, but we have to be okay with that as well. Yeah, there's sometimes there are good reasons to be a bit uh, careful with uh, invasive species eh, like the famous Japanese knotweed, uh, which is, but the problem is not that it's Japanese. The problem is that it just eats away the living space of all our plants. Yeah. So, and let's say there's a, a, a little bit of a difference between the political functioning of invasive and the ecological functioning of evasive, uh, invasive. But um, so, um, uh, uh, and the, for in, uh, species that can connect to local ecosystems, I mean, you can consider them invasive from a, uh, from a kind of traditionalist idea about the purity of ecosystems. But if they're actually managed to get in touch, they have to arrange uh, have uh, mutually supportive relationships with other beings, that is, I, I would say there's no real reason to call them invasive. I mean, it's just that they came from abroad, but this is, uh, and then, but the, the rest is a kind of, yeah, I think a uh, misguided idea of purism, which, uh, yeah. Should and let's let's um, <laughs> now that's this is this is interesting and touching about upon the terminology uh, of the biologist and ecologist uh, in the harbor. But uh, Mark, uh, in your presentation, you very briefly mentioned that you also collaborated with local experts uh, working in the harbor. Uh, did you also um, work together with this uh, Chanti uh, choir or you just drop them uh, a visit and how, how did that work? Because that's yet a very different uh, perspective again. Yeah. Those are very different species again, one could say. Yeah. yeah, I think if you want to talk about uh, or give the perspective of also where we came from, as in how this came to be, how the port came to be like this, uh, I was looking for something that could tell that story. And then you can show a lot of uh, graphs or like data, like I did in my presentation showing um, these maps. And then you can say, oh yeah, sure. Uh, but on an affect, it doesn't really make a, a sense. So when, when uh, I started working with the Shanty Choir, because they have these songs about how the uh, ports used to be uh, and I found one of these songs that they sing it's not original shanty but it's in the same tradition about how the port was is and always will be the same so um, using that song I thought that was an excellent way of talking about uh, the fact that it is actually changing um, because we see these singers these old men we know this is Im Im immaterial heritage which is uh, uh, fleeting, like uh, maybe two more generations, and it's probably uh, forgotten. So uh, we see them in their original clothing, and then using this in the work will they will I think strengthen uh, the fact that we start to realize how fast we actually went with this uh, creating these infrastructures in the port. And so yes, they will be in the work. Um, uh, I filmed them like one, uh, one at a time and they will be on different screens and uh, kind of be in conversation within the sculptural uh, uh, presence of the work uh, with this uh, tube worm. Oh, this, this is interesting. So um, to go back to class, uh, does your model uh, also provide space for uh, local uh, lay people or local experts who do represent a very different perspective or a very different objective uh, when it comes to the importance of a place like a port or uh, a nature or whatsoever? Uh, basically, it's very open. So the uh, idea is always like it... it the model kind of hatches onto something that already exists, some kind of organization. You can also start from scratch, uh, founding a ZOOP, but based in, for now we're starting with um, organizations that transform into ZOOPs. And yeah, as, as with most organizations, although let's say 
call it the board. Eh? There is a central body where certain policies get formalized, but where these ideas come from is not from the board. And they, there's always a large group of people, including all their networks and support um, support networks that that make up, let's say, the culture of a place. And uh, and, and, and this could be, like, for instance, the Nieuwe Institute is the first ZOOP in the world. Eh? So I'm, I'm talking now from my experience there. So... Yeah, we have a lot of visitors and, and, and a network of members and a lot of collaborators. And yeah, many different people have very specific, but also very different interests in this, um, uh, in the Dewey Institute. And then also by extension, or sometimes in the first place, into ZOOP. And they all find their own ways of doing it. Some, some people are more interested in doing research yeah, or particularly uh, yeah, understanding ecological integrity in a, in a, in a, in a current way. Um, the whole element of sensitizing to uh, to form relations beyond the human sphere is extremely important and is part of yeah of storytelling of filmmaking of a lot of different kind of artistic uh, practices. Uh, local knowledge is extremely important. Uh, knowledge of the landscape is extremely important. How I mean, is there a topsoil on top of an older substrate, or is this, or or is this a soil that is I don't know, ten thousand years old? I mean, is it a, an old river, or is it uh, is it was it moved from another place to has be building ground? Yeah, there's endless endless let's say entry points for different for different kinds of interests. But uh, yeah. Then just to zoom in uh, on what you just said, uh, Mark, uh, you are also uh, teaching. Uh, do you consider yourself a speaker for the living when you're teaching? Uh, does that make sense? Well, I teach at uh, the Masters called Ecology Futures at the Arts Academy in the Mos. Um, and this is very much about these sorts of topics. Um, as, um, do I consider myself a speaker for a living? I think my students all have the capacity to, or most of them at least, have the capacity to uh, uh, be a speaker for a living. Um, so I can imagine that uh, uh, I don't need to do that, especially because I'm teaching there. I think they all signed up for the, pro pro for the program because they uh, have this sensibility already. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's very but, modest. <laughs> no, but what you just said is exactly what uh, our, and now I'm talking about the new institute, our speaker for the living, who's Michael van Stiphout, also says, like, my job is not just to be the speaker for the living, but uh, my job is to have, kind of allow others to internalize this role. So uh, yeah. it's specifically when she's not there, uh, it's the others that have to kind of take this on board and be have become to embody this themselves. So it's, I think it's, a perfect answer for a speaker for the living. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. that's a compliment for Mark. Mark, oh, thank you. well done. Yeah. Um, we're coming towards the end of this beautiful conversation, but before closing, I would like to ask both of you for a takeaway for our audience. Um, an online audience, you never know who that is, but uh, our audience is probably uh, including art lovers, scientists, uh, students, educators, ecologists, and everyone who is interested in the Port of Rotterdam for this special edition. So Klaas, what's uh, your takeaway for our audience? Ooh, uh zoop.earth uh, if you are interested in uh, um, learning more about the zoop model uh, if you're interested in applying it to your own organization um, uh, another thing i would like to add is this uh, i find a very interesting perspective is uh, uh, novel ecosystems so to think of uh, things i mean ports are particularly strong in this because they are have always been this global kind of touch points uh, but that uh, ecosystems are food webs that uh, also occur yeah, in response to all kinds of human interventions. That we think of novel ecosystems is ecosystems that imply also human uh, agency. So that's the last thing. 
uh, zoops do not work on just ecological regeneration we work on the realization of human inclusive ecosystems which to are in our perspective is identical to the idea of a regenerative economy uh, this is like I said the only in a, in a way the inevitable darwinian endpoint of this crisis anything that is alive in 100 years from now from now yeah, it has to be something like a human inclusive ecosystem. Uh, I mean, all the end, all the rest, I would say, is um, yeah, pretty much doomed. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a very positive note to end on. Uh... <laughs> no, it's not. It's not nice if you have kids. I mean, for me, it's okay. I'll, I'll live through, but uh, my kids will yeah. really go through this. It will be horrible. And and the only thing, so it's. So it's a it's a very solid long term investment to think of something that is climate adaptive that can. Uh, uh, support uh, that supports the life ca carrying capacity of the earth. This is really the only way out, and this includes sports. This is uh, now, this, of course, this is uh, very true that uh, we are uh, referring to longer term um, solutions and uh, more sustainable systems in general, and I think that's pretty clear from also uh, your statement, uh, Mark, uh, in this residency. What would you uh, like to share as a takeaway for our audience, Mark? Well, this is hard to follow up, um, uh, but I think maybe I can offer a takeaway for people on a different kind of, I mean, this is a good good advice when you're talking about uh, businesses or uh, corporations or, or you already know a lot about the subject, but like I said, for me, when I did this residency and uh, amongst these uh, indigenous uh, Mapuche people in Chile, this was a transformative moment for me, um, for my, uh, me as a person and as an artist, and these two are very well connected. So and what, what was also transformative for me to, is to do a lot of walks with city ecologists so you can see what is actually uh, on that, that there's carrots uh, growing uh, on the in the place where you park your car, for example. So these are very. This is a very simple but a bit more low key uh, takeaway, which I would want to give. That's exactly. Uh, that's exactly where it starts. This is the whole point. You're already in the midst of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, dear audience, that was it for uh, this edition of the Start for Water vlog. Um, I would like to thank both uh, Mark and Klaas for this beautiful conversation and our online audience. Thank you for uh, viewing this edition and please stay tuned for more editions of the vlog um, series uh, Starts for Water. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.